Thank you for joining us for the first online version of the Abilities Path Authors Luncheon. Um, we hope you're safe, that you have some snacks and beverages lined up, and you're ready to kick back and enjoy the evening with us. Now, before we get into um, some of our chit chat, I'd like to invite my co-presenters to say a little bit about themselves. Let's start with you, Carol. Hi, I, my, name, my name is Carol Windsor, and I've been associated uh, with the agency many names back since 1984, and I'm currently a member of the Auxiliary, and this year I'm president. Thank you, and Paula? Hi, my name's Paula Rini. I'm a longtime volunteer, uh, originally with Abilities United, now Ability Path. Happy to move on and meet some new folks and staff members. Um, I'm a member of the committee and really happy to be involved again. Um, as a member in the past, I co-chaired for five years, both with Mary Kabakov and Rachel Seegers. And I'm excited to be here and have you guys join us for this virtual event. Yeah, thank you, Paula and Jerry. And, and hello everyone, I'm Jerry King. Um, I first got involved with what was Abilities United 10 years ago as a board member, and I've stayed connected with the group. Uh, today, I serve on the Ability Path Executive Council um, and just think the organization does a wonderful job. So I, I have enjoyed these authors' luncheons for the last 10 years, and I'm sure you will too. Yeah, and Jerry can, can tell you many of our neighbors have enjoyed these events, so we hope that they're enjoying us online this year for the first time. And so I'm Jen Wagstaff Hinton. I'm a, a Palo Alto native, a family that's been served or engaged in this agency, Abilities United, now Ability Path, for many, many decades. Delighted to be here, currently a board member. Um, my daughter Jane has served in the adult program and she has two big baby brothers, Jim and Joe and, and her dad, John. So we're delighted to be here today. And so this is really a unique time, right? This is the 29th anniversary of the Authors' Luncheon, but the first time we're doing an evening edition on a weeknight online. And um, we're excited to do this. We've had several successes earlier this year for those that attended our 100th anniversary of Gate Path and then the rebranding. And so with so many years under our belts and then the rebranding, I'd like to invite Jerry, who served on that committee with Carol and others, to just talk a little bit about what that branding effort meant. Can you just comment, Jerry? Well, sure. You know, with this exciting um, combination of Abilities United and Gate Path, we had an opportunity to ensure that we had a brand name that really meant something to our community, to our donors, to our partners. And uh, so we came together, we really listened hard to our participants, donors, we did some research, we looked at what would be most appropriate and relevant to our community. Uh, and thus the name Ability Path was born along with the tagline of inspiring inclusion, which is what we're all about, bringing together communities uh, those with disabilities, all abilities, let's pull all abilities together. So uh, we're very excited about the new rebrand. We've gotten great positive feedback for, from it. I'm, I'm sure you started to see the materials and the logos. So thank you for everyone who supported us. And you know, we've got another hundred years now to get the name out. Years. So yeah. yeah, thank you. 
And thanks to Carol and the auxiliary who put together hundreds of activity packs for the adult program every week. Jane received her activity pack on Friday with her first Ability Path t-shirt. So we were <laughs> delighted and we have it out here in the kitchen right now. So, Great. so good. So for anybody that's new to this online format, you'll want to keep watching here, but also open up another device like your phone to abilitypath.org forward slash bid. And that will enable you to look at the artwork that we have available for auction. We have five pieces from our local artists. Plus, um, we do invite you to donate uh, to the cause since this is a, our, our annual fundraiser for the Legacy Organization. Now, um, for those that are um, coming back, I'd like to invite uh, Carol to talk about what it was like for your first um, attendance at the Authors Luncheon last year in 2019 in the big grand ballroom at Crown Plaza. How did you all feel? We were all excited. Um, we had three tables and it, the whole experience from the time you walked in and they had a, a coffee stand and a, and a wine bar and then you walked in through the gauntlet of books and artwork and then you went in and sat down and enjoyed three fascinating authors, people that maybe you wouldn't have known about before. And afterward, everyone was um, just commenting about what a fantastic, fantastic uh, event it was. So we're yeah. excited. And, and one of the things that really makes a great event is a great MC. And I'd like to invite Paula to just tell her little story about how we landed hanging with Langan, Maureen Langan, as our MC, now coming back for her third year. Go ahead, Paula. Well, Maureen's been a good friend of mine for quite a number of years. She used to live down the street. Um, and you may not know she's a stand comic but she's also a journalist so she's got these this blending of talent and skill to bring to this kind of an event so i'd been wanting to ask her for a long time but we had mcs until we didn't finally one year the person couldn't come back and we also thought we might get somebody new to do the auction job so i said how about if i ask this friend of mine and see if she could do both of them because i know she could completely handle the double job and she hit it out of the park from the first year. Yeah, so so I'm just thrilled that it's been a great combination um, for her to work with the agency and to come back for her third time is awesome. Yeah. Really yeah. And what's great about Maureen is she tells her personal story about her brother as well. So uh, it's just so heartwarming and funny. I mean, yeah. um, she's a, a gut splitter. So uh, thank yeah. you for bringing her into the family. My pleasure. And now mission moment. So Jerry, um, talk a little bit about what the mission moment in the historical um, Authors' Luncheon is meant to you? Well, I, I, we have one tonight, and these are usually uh, a moment for you to understand the impact that Ability Path has had on our families and participants. Um, it's usually a fairly long uh, journey as uh, participants have to learn how to be independent, live on their own, develop the right skills, um, and it's incredibly touching to hear what families have to say and how this has all worked. Uh, Jen, you were the mission moment. You talked about your daughter, Jane, and the, the path that you had to go through with your family a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it really brings what we do to life. And people understand and feel what it means to have a child with disabilities and to see them grow and mature and become independent. So. There was not a dry eye in the house after yeah. you spoke. So yeah. it's really, um, it's really heartwarming. Yeah, I agree. It really touches the soul um, to see uh, that it, this is a we conversation, not a they conversation. Yeah. So thank you, Jerry. Um, now, briefly, uh, we also have art. We're bringing back art this year. It's an online auction. Um, and so I'd like to invite both Paula and Carol as our resident artists to talk about and, and by the way, Brian Nider's mother uh, as well. What is the importance of art to programs like ours? Oh, it's, it, Jen, it's invaluable. The visual arts, participating in the visual arts is so important for, I personally believe for everyone, but particularly this population. Yeah. And to have the opportunity for them to display their pieces and have people potentially purchase a piece is invaluable so please take a look at the pieces um, and know how much heart and soul has gone into each one of them yeah thank you paula yeah and carol any comments 
I agree. It's I think that the art is is a place that allows anyone to experience something without verbal, um, yeah. without verbiage. And a lot of the participants that may not be verbal are really attracted to it. And they yeah. find themselves at home in being able to express themselves. It's really valuable. It, it really is. And it's quite serendipitous that our uh, refurbished Art and Computer Center at the old Abilities United headquarter on Charleston. We just squeaked that in on March 5th, and I hope a number of you, I know that a number of you were there. I know Jerry was there. Um, it's amazing on March 5th, one week later, how much our world had changed, and yet that day and that event brought so much joy to so many people. Um, it was uh, just great, and we'll be open again at some point in the future, but that was really an uplifting event, I think, for, for many of the artists. Uh, and so uh, briefly, just um, I'd like to invite for a couple of comments, authors. Who's excited to hear about our authors coming up today? I know I'm excited to hear about the psychiatrist, um, given the circumstances, but how about some of the others here? Oh, I think it'd be great to hear from Deborah Madison and see what her memoir holds about her life in the food world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to see, hear the, the graphic artist talk about his work and ha his mission to use graphic arts, um, the format to get people to read. And yeah. I think that's such a, a draw. So I'm excited to see that. Yeah, and Jerry, anything from your end? You know, they all sound wonderful. I know when I've gone to that luncheon, I usually end up leaving thinking, oh, I have to read every single book now that I've just heard about. Uh, I think in particular, Daniel Mason, who uh, teaches both humanities and medicine at Stanford, if I read the bio right, uh, that's a great combination of yes. science and art. So I'm really intrigued to see what he has to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's going to be a very exciting evening. So I think we're ready to do a wrap here. It's really been fun catching up with you all, uh, ladies. And... Um, I will look forward to seeing you in the program shortly. Everybody stay safe and have a fun time this evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Yeah. Fun. Hey, good evening, you guys. Welcome, welcome. I'm Maureen Lagan. I am your host and your MC for Ability Paths Virtual Evening Edition of the 29th Annual Authors Luncheon. It's so good to be here. So good to see all of you. Wow, look at you. You are a good looking group of people. Overall, one or two of you, I'm like, wow. But overall, Hey, listen, this is the first time I've put on lipstick since March. Anyway, look, I'm really excited to be, I see so many great faces, so many wonderful people who support Ability Path. I first learned of this organization through my good friend, Paula Rini. She serves on the author's luncheon planning committee. Where are you, Paula? I know you're out there. I love pa Paula. You know, she is such a wonderful person. She supports this organization and she got me on board and I'm so happy about that. Uh, she asked me a few years ago if I'd be interested in hosting. And I said, are you uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I was on board immediately. And here we are three years later, a year uh, unlike any other. I feel like I could work in Silicon Valley, <laughs> this, this technology. Um, but like all of us, Ability Path has quickly adjusted all of their programs for children and adults with developmental disabilities to virtual formats. Uh, including teletherapy, online classes for adults, and remote independent living and job coaching. That's a lot, but they're doing it, and they're doing it well. Um, no, it's just, it's insane right now, but I'm glad we're all here doing this. So I want to tell you why Ability Path means so much to me. The connection for me is uh, about my brother, Hugh. I'm one of six children, and my brother is 10 and a half months and one day older than I Irish Catholic. So when we were growing up, he and I were in the same grade together. He was what they called then a slow learner, neurologically impaired. 
he, it turns out he had a slight brain injury and the doctors don't know if he was born that way or if it was the result of a high fever when he had the measles as a toddler. But regardless of what it was, today he might have been probably considered on the spectrum, but we didn't talk about any of this. It was like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And you can't do that with people. You have to let them be who they are and realize their potential in their own way, which is what you folks do. So as an adult, I finally sat him down and I said, you know, the reason life, because kids in school were horrible to him. They mocked him. They bullied him. They made fun of him. It was just awful. So I sat him down and I said, you know, the reason life has been challenging for you is because you have a slight brain injury and you are what they call neurologically impaired. That's why life has been challenging. But if you do the work, you'll get to the finishing line, but you just have to challenge yourself more than maybe some other people do. So this was his response. He goes, wait, so I'm brain injured. I said, yes. He goes, wow. So that means I'm not weird. He was so relieved that he's not weird and that he had a brain injury. And I said, you know what? You are weird because you're my brother, but you're weird for different reasons. So that's why I love what you do. Uh, Today, tonight, we're going to present to you three incredible award-winning authors. Jean Luen Yang. He's a graphic novelist. And when I heard the word graphic, I thought, oh my gosh, is this uh, pornography? But it's not. Graphic novelists are those who use illustrations to tell their stories We have Deborah Madison. She gives vegetables a good name. She's a chef and a cookbook author. And we have Daniel Mason. Daniel is a novelist and and a Stanford psychiatrist, underachiever. So I got to speak to them a little bit ahead of time uh, to meet them. I wanted to call them and Zoom with them and just have a little familiarity with them so that when we chat about their books, I have some background. You're going to love them. Each one is so humble and so talented. So I'm excited for you to get to know their work better. And you can get to know their books really well, thanks to the generous friends that we have at Books, Inc. They have been supporting the Authors Luncheon for 15 years now. And you can purchase books by all of the authors or any book that you want in the entire world, assuming Books, Inc. has it. And a portion of your purchase will go to Benefit Ability Path. So how do you do it? I'll tell you. You just go to abilitypath.org forward slash bookstore, enter the code abilitypath2020 at checkout through this Sunday, October 25th. So you have a few days to do that. And we have the information on the screen and in the video. You though, we want to keep you watching to hear from our authors. So you get the full event experience. I mean, that's very important, but we also want you to stay connected to what's going on here tonight too, the the books online. So this is what I want to recommend you do. You go and open another tab in your browser. I know you'll be fine. Open another tab in your browser, or if you have a second device handy, like I do a iPhone, if you have another device or what we want you to do this way, you can check out the online bookstore on one device, and then you can be focused on the donating portion during the fund to future, because I know you want to donate and I know you don't want to miss that. And you can bid on the artwork, artwork. And if you have any questions with all this, you need some help right now, what you can do is call or text us at 650-800-6696. All right. So for those of you who have attended the author's luncheon in the past, and I see some of those beautiful faces, Uh, And those of you who are joining us for the first time, we have the absolute best calendar. It's so fantastic because it has artwork by the people who participate in the Ability Path programs. And since we're online this year, we're going to mail the calendar, the 2021 art calendar to you in December, but we have to have your mailing address. So if we don't have your mailing address, you're not gonna get this great calendar and you're gonna be really sad. So make sure you're on the mailing list. And this way you'll receive a copy. You can sign up at abilitypath.org forward slash art calendar, art calendar. And tonight we have five incredible pieces from the calendar that have been framed by Great American Framing Company. And they're going to be available for bidding in our art auction tonight through Sunday, October 25th at 9 p.m. That's when the bidding ends. 
And you can visit abilitypath.org forward slash bid to view and bid on the artwork, those five pieces that I'm going to describe to you in a moment. But to get you excited to see what is in this for all of us, see this piece of art behind me? Hello, are you looking at this? Where did Maureen get it? I got it my first year hosting uh, Ability Path uh, Authors Luncheon. Look at this. Is this not gorgeous? Is it colorful? Is it fun? It makes me happy. But what else, Maureen? I'll tell you what else I got. All right. I have every year I bid on artwork because I, I love it. Look at this. Are you looking at this? How about this? How, how much fun is this? And gorgeous is that, huh? All right. I love it. But um, that's why you got to do I mean, It's so much fun to have creative, unique pieces on your wall that you're not going to, it's like not mass produced. All right. So here, let me describe some of the pieces to you. We have Surfboard by Daniel Arroyo, who participates in the independent living skills and computer education programs at Ability Path, as well as taking art classes in the community. He works from his imagination and composes his own photographs for reference. <clears throat> Black Wolf by Michael Broadhurst, whose paintings reflect his vision of an animal kingdom where all the animals of the world live harmoniously and experience the freedom to be wild. He's inspired by his love of animals and years of volunteering at the Palo Alto Junior Zoo and Museum. Michael is enrolled in the Ability Path Independent Living Skills and computer education programs and supplements his income with art sales, you see. Now look at it, like independent living skills, computer education programs, that's where your money, your donations and your generosity goes. Um, and it helps artists supplement their income. It's just total win, win, win. We have Fire Dream by Mark Gregory, whose style is characterized by geometric shapes, lines, bursts of colors, filling the whole page in a puzzle-like style with no gaps, no overlaps. He says, and I quote, art like other things takes practice. I am a prolific artist because I enjoy it so, end quote. Calm Day at Sea by Jazz Three, who creates abstracted designs using her preferred medium of markers on paper. She spends hours replicating her pattern over and over in different shades of color. Animals in nature inspire Jazz 3's drawings and sculptures. What? Did I hear sculpture? Okay. Look what I got. Last year, I bid upon this. This is my elephant. Is she not the cutest thing? Look at the, I, this is what I got. I bid on this. I love it. She, she looks over me. She's the best. So these are the kind of things you can do. We have Mountain Stream by Judy Wachner, a prolific artist who has exhibited her work at locations like the de Young's 2015 Art Slam, the Children's Discovery Museum, and the Palo Alto Art Center's Community Gallery. Judy enrolled in the Ability Path Computer Education Program so that she could expand her artistic talent through the use of computer technology and also participated in the Independent Living Skills Program. Let us we have so much to talk about today. I want to say on behalf of the thousands of community members with developmental disabilities whose lives you make better, thank you again for joining us tonight and for your advocacy, your inclusion, your respect, and yes, your generosity, because I know you're opening those wallets and pocketbooks wide tonight. Uh, we got to have an incredible auction. It's going to be exciting. And, and Brian, the CEO I'm going to razz him so much. We're going to do the auction later. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So are we ready to get this party started? You want to kick off the evening? Yes, we do. All right. I would like to welcome, and I want all of us to give a warm Zoom welcome to Ability Path Board Chair, Elaine Cohen. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you, Maureen. It's an honor to be with you tonight for what I know will be a fun and inspirational evening. I have the honor of representing Ability Pass dedicated board of directors, and I'm also privileged to be a member of the Ability Path Auxiliary, an extraordinary group of women who have been supporting Ability Pass mission for 70 years. I know many of our board members and auxiliary members are with us online tonight. 
I want to extend my gratitude for their volunteer hours, their financial support, and especially their unwavering dedication to Abilities Pass Mission of Inclusion. I'd also like to thank our event planning committee for their time and energy to bring us such a wonderful program this evening. Several committee members have renewed their volunteer commitment year after year, and we're so tremendously grateful for their dedication. Ability Pass 100 years of service and impact are made possible thanks to our generous community of supporters. And it's my privilege now to acknowledge our sponsors of this year's Authors Luncheon Virtual Evening Edition. We are extremely grateful to our platinum sponsors, Rachel and Simon Seegers, Stanley E. Hansen Foundation. Our gold sponsors, Lori Jarrett, Christina Kendrick, Susan and Sanji Vaswani, Patty and Jim White, and two anonymous donors. Next are our silver sponsors, Breaking Glass Forums, Claudia Clausen, Wilson Sansini Goodrich and Rosati Foundation, and on to our bronze sponsors, Thomas and Wallace Brunner, Vanessa and Michael De La Cruz, Nancy Drapkin, Sarah and Mike Harmon, El Camino Health, Goldman Sachs Gives on behalf of Tammy Keeley, John Hinton and Jan Wegstaff Hinton, Mary and David Kabakov, Katie and Brian Nider, Alicia and Merrill Newman, Judith and David Richardson, and Elizabeth Wolf. Many of you have been longtime friends of Ability Path, and your ongoing support is so meaningful to our mission. A big thank you to all our sponsors. We appreciate your support that made tonight possible. And now I'd like to turn it over to Ability Path CEO Brian Nider. We're extremely fortunate to have his visionary and compassionate leadership. Thank you, Elaine, and a big thank you to Maureen as well. Maureen is an award-winning broadcast journalist and stand-up comic who performs across the U.S. and internationally. You may have heard her on KGO Radio in San Francisco, where she hosted Hanging with Langan for seven years. Hanging with Langan is now a podcast where you can hear her interview authors, academics, and comics. Always fun, always smart. Listen on Apple, Spotify, and at MaureenLangan.com. Maureen, we are thrilled and grateful to have you back hosting the Authors Luncheon for this very special virtual evening edition. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a remarkable year for Ability Path in so many ways. Almost one year ago, Abilities United and Gate Path joined forces. The merging of our teams and programs went even more smoothly than I could have anticipated. I think this is largely because of the core values we all share and because of our employees' incredible dedication to our mission. As a result of the merger, we were able to repurpose the former administrative building on Charleston to a dedicated space for our art, computer, and employment programs for adults. It's a beautiful facility, and I can't wait for you to join us there in the future for art exhibitions. I'm honored to also share for the first time tonight that we are remodeling the facility over on Middlefield Road and we are gonna name it after Linda Steele, who is the beloved leader of Abilities United for more than two decades. We'll definitely host a grand opening, ribbon cutting. It might be virtual. Hopefully we can do it in person, but when we do that, we wanna share with you what that new space looks like, appropriately honoring Linda for her years of commitment to Abilities United. Well, the merger happened to coincide with conversations about changing our name as well. After nearly two years of research and input from our entire community, staff, participants, families. We chose the name Ability Path to better reflect our mission of acceptance, respect, and inclusion. There was no better time to announce our name change than at our centennial. Yes, this year we celebrate 100 years of impact in the community. We've come a long way in a century, and I am incredibly proud of our team's work every day as they empower children and adults with the developmental disabilities to achieve their full potential. 
In particular, our team's response to COVID-19 pandemic has been absolutely extraordinary. Back in March, they immediately converted in-person services to engaging online formats. Since then, they've continued to meet the evolving needs of the children, adults, and families we serve. I wanna give you some examples of the amazing things our teams have done over the last seven months. It's pretty, pretty spectacular. Our speech, occupational, and physical therapists and early interventionists are providing therapy to more than 400 children with special needs. They wanna make sure that they can sustain their learning and development progress even during the pandemic. Our inclusive preschools where children with and without special needs attend classes together are providing in-person and virtual options. They've been back to class since uh, June 15th. We also have been renovating and expanding the preschool location in Palo Alto, which will be opening in January with updated classrooms and a brand new playground. We're very excited about that. Our adult services teams have developed more than 160 online classes that are offered each and every week to help individuals stay engaged and connected during the pandemic. There are topics for everyone from computer skills to music to science. The adults who have limited or no access to technology, we've been delivering weekly activity packs. And to date, I think we're getting close to 2,000 activity packs having been delivered since the start of the uh, shelter in place orders. And our incredible ability path auxiliary, the volunteers there have weekly lunches with participants with a social connection hour on Zoom. Our independent living skills coaches are ensuring adults have support with all the daily living and emergency needs they might have. This includes everything from household chores to monitoring health conditions and maintaining food and other essentials that they may need and just staying connected. Our employment services team is supporting the unique needs of those working as frontline workers during the pandemic. We have a lot of folks, I think it's closer to 60 plus individuals working as essential workers in their jobs at grocery stores, pharmacies, and a lot of other locations between San Mateo and Santa Clara County. These jobs provide adults that we serve with self-esteem, inclusion, a paycheck, and expands a circle of friendship and support. You know, I've seen this firsthand. Before I came to Ability Path, I was an executive at Electronic Arts for nearly three decades. Electronic Arts is also one of our dedicated community partners employing folks in our employment services program. I saw there firsthand the positive impact on the lives of everyone on that campus that benefited from having an inclusive work setting. Over the next several months, we're gonna be sharing with you stories about five individuals who found meaningful employment in the community. And tonight you're gonna get a sneak peek at our very first story. So right now, I'd like you to stay tuned. I want you to watch and meet Shane. My autism was making it hard for me to find a job and I needed help. It was really hard and stressful, mostly for my mom since she was trying to help me get a job. And then we end up in ability path. The challenges that I had with working is rushing and not thinking straight. I'm very grateful for ability path. If it weren't for them, I wouldn't be working here at Knob Hill. My ability path, job coach Dorothy, helped me along the way. She would actually give me some good pointer uppers, helps me slow down a lot. So when it's slow in the check stands, I would clean the table. I interact with customers a lot and it helped me with social skills. One of my favorite parts is collecting the cards because I get to be outside and be more active. Shane, as an ability path hire, has been doing great. He went through the same interview process as any other employee would go through, and we saw something in him that we knew would work. So Shane right now is uh, at the point where we don't even need to ask him to do the things that we've asked him to do before. He just automatically does them. He's been very focused, very task-oriented, and just all around an all-star employee. I feel really good getting a paycheck every week and live independently. Working with the people at Knob Hill is pretty great. They're wonderful people. They're really nice. They help me a lot. The assistant manager says that I'm his number one guy.
great to hear Shane's story, Maureen. You the know, thing Brian, I noticed was before COVID. So sorry, I was just going to say this is that was filmed before COVID, uh, and mm -hmm. Shane has been working since then because uh, he is uh, part of the essential workforce out there making things happen. You and I were talking, uh, you know, before this great event, and I said to you we were talking about how people with special needs or disabilities are only limited by what we think they can do. They're very competent, very oh. capable, but we as a society decides, well, I don't know if they can do that. It's changing that in society, that's huge. Oh, you know, I couldn't agree more. I think when we listen to what people's dreams and desires are, we become life coaches and we help them achieve the things that they desire. And I think that's really the focal point of a lot of our programs has been about fulfillment, you know, achieving the goals that individuals have. And, and Shane, you know, achieved his dream of being over at Knob Hill. And it's great how that worked out for him. And you can see the kind of impact he's having there at that store. And I used to get a chance to see him pre-COVID when I'd go over there and grab lunch sometimes and be able to see Shane, you know, making things happen over at Knob Hill. Well, you'll have to go see the number one guy at Knob Hill when this is behind us, right? Um, Absolutely. So what I love is that the money that people donate tonight and throughout, I mean, they can continue to donate beyond tonight, but the money they donate goes to help people like Shane and so many others live independently and have their jobs and so, you know, supports the coaching that they need so they can continue working. So what is our goal tonight to raise, Brian? So our goal is to raise 125000 for the Fund of Future. And like we were just talking, it is about funding the future for the folks that we serve and empowering yes. our, our team members to make sure they can deliver the kind of support and services to help that happen. So 125,000 is our goal, and I'm confident we're probably gonna beat it. Oh, yeah, we are. Hell yeah. We're gonna beat that for sure. Come on, come on, come out, Palo Alto. You got the big Absolutely. bucks. We know you're gonna do this. So tell us how, I know that one way, and I'll ask you to tell us the other, there's going to be, we have it right up there, how different ways that people can donate. You can do abilitypath.org forward slash bid. What else we got, Brian, on that? that Abilitypath.org forward slash pledge. And if they want to text or call, they can go to 650-800-6696. So multiple ways to make that happen and to be able to fuel the work that we do and support the folks in our programs. That number, once again, 650-800-6696. But operator you don't have to do it just by. tonight. You do it tonight. Sorry? I said operator standing by. I know, one Adam 12. So the thing is, you can, we want you to donate tonight. We want you to support tonight. But you tomorrow morning, you know, tell your friends. This, this is ongoing. This just doesn't end ever. All right. So that is exactly what do we have a thermometer? What are we doing? Do we have a thermometer, right? That's well, going to show we what we're doing. We're going to there we go. There's a thermometer. So we're starting at uh, just about 17,000 to kick things off for the evening. And uh, I think we have some matching gifts. So we're going to reveal those in just a minute. We have several anonymous donors who have put together a $40,000 matching gift. And we have the board and advice, CEO advisory council that have put together another $10,000 matching gift. So we've got $50,000 of matching gifts. So people can make an impact, double their money tonight, being able to get us towards our goal. But more importantly, you know, giving us the ability to deliver services to children, adults, and families in all of our programs in San Mateo and Santa Clara County. Oh, my God. It just went up to $57,350. It just went, what? I like that. Shout out. I can't even, I need anonymous donors in my life. That's what I need. <laughs> yes. Know, it's amazing. Wow, that's incredible. 67. We're at this, I'm like, I feel like I'm at the Jerry Lewis Telethon. This is amazing. They raised a lot of money. Yeah. That's why I'm saying that is I used to work great. on that. Great. So again, for anybody listening right now, we've got matching gifts of $50,000. Look at that. Already 72350 That is awesome. <laughs> You know, one thing, Maureen, that, uh, that you know, is, is worth just kind of mentioning to folks, you know, in the middle of COVID, it has obviously put a lot of, you know, challenges to our, our programs. And since the start of it, we made a commitment back with our board that we have not had to lay off one single employee. And we I made that it. commitment. Wait, we got to thank it. We got a shout out, Frank Berry. 
uh, Jean and oh, William Farrellich. We have to thank Farrelich. these people. If I miss anybody, Aline and Robert Seelig. I'm sorry if we miss some awesome. of you. This is all, That's it's a whole new world, right? So we're we're thinking, looking at the moms. All, all these wonderful donations are going to support our staff who deliver the programs every single day. And uh, that is so critical. And we want to be there. And McGee, thank you. I, Sue and Ken Merrill. Yes. Woo woo, Sue and Ken. Marcy, Marcy Brown. Marcy Brown. Marcy Start to freeze. Our own outside attorneys. Jen Wagstaff Hinton and John Hinton. Thank you, Jen and John. And Jane. Art, Art Stoffer. Art This is great. Look at this. This is fantastic. Teresa LaJoy, Terry LaJoy. Thank you, Terry. This is unbelievable. We're up to 85,600. Carolyn Joel Friedman, Carol. thank you. Oh, wait, you uh, guys are moving it so fast. I can't keep up. <laughs> Marilyn, oh my gosh, Iris and Hal, Carol. Wanda and Lawrence Wong, thank you. This is fantastic. So again, I as like I was mentioning, people. Is these people are making a difference. Your donations are helping us serve 160 classes, deliver activity packs, deliver remote teletherapy to kids across the counties, and to be able to make sure our preschools are up and running, our staff are taken care of, uh, our, our family resource center is holding support groups. Julian Spencer Shanson, thank you. Uh, so people, Harry thank you so Susan. much. <laughs> Harry and Susan, um, holy, this is just, listen, if we didn't shout out your name, it's because you're among so many wonderfully generous people. And it's, it's like going like Lucy and Ethel on the conveyor belt, trying to get all the chocolates. Uh, we love you guys. This is so exciting. $88,000 so far. So please know we're seeing you. We, it will be acknowledged fully if we miss you right now. Brian, I'm like so excited. All right, go ahead. If I interrupt you, it's because names are coming by. All right. That is fantastic. Back to you, Brian. So, yes. So, uh, again, I was just mentioning that uh, all the, and, and Carrie, thank you, Anne. Thank you so much. Um, where do we want to start? I guess we kind of already started the bidding. So what do you think here, Maureen? All right, so this is what I'm going to say because I'm very excited and I'm really seeing uh, the hedge fund people coming out. We need you. We know you make a lot of money. We don't know what you do, but we're happy that you make a lot of money because you're there right. for us. We're going to start the bidding at 10,000. You can do a lot higher, much higher, but we're going to start the bidding at 10,000 and you're going to help children like a young boy named Brady. He's seven years old and he receives speech teletherapy, which is so important right now when we're isolated. Now, Brady's mother, of course, she's a concerned mother. She was like, wow, how is this teletherapy thing going to work? Is it a right fit for my son? He has a hard time sitting still, like every seven-year-old. And uh, But his ability path speech therapist, she keeps him engaged the entire session, mom says, and he has continued to make just great progress. So that's the type of thing that your money goes to. Think of Brady sitting home, learning, getting better in his speech skills. You can feel so proud of yourself when you do things like that. Oh, yeah. And and by the way, those hedge fund folks, this is no time to be hedging. They need to jump in and support us. So they've got the means, a lot of IPOs here in the Valley. So we're counting on you to help give us a hand here uh, during the uh, uh, crazy pandemic. So uh, you can jump on in. Okay. And then we have, um, so the next level we're at, did we talk about the packets so that go out, Brian? We did not talk the about the packet. So $5,000 level, the sort of things that that can support. You want to go ahead and. Yeah, let me tell them about this. Cause I think, um, I think this, I really like this because there are people home. Of course, we're talking about people being isolated, but yet they need the connection to continue growing. Yes. So when you donate $5,000, you help continue these engaging activity packets, they're called. They're packets with a lot of activities in it that engage the people, that thus engaging activity packets for people like uh, Madeline and Lenora. Now the packets have a lot of different cool things in them, worksheets to keep them engaged, learning resources, but games, magazines, art supplies, and handwritten note from volunteers, the auxiliary volunteers. and 
people are sta standing in their doorway in looking out the window like it's Christmas. Every week these come. And this is the type of thing that you help with your support, which is awesome. Maybe they'll get Twister in there. I keep saying I want Twister in these packages. That would be, that <laughs> you know would be great. And it, you know, and, and it couldn't be more important. Uh, that Social connection right now is so critical. There's a lot of isolation, obviously a lot of mental health channel challenges for so many folks. And that connection point with our staff and the folks that we serve to be able to drop off the pack and have a conversation, engage, makes all the difference in the world. Now, a lot of these folks don't have access to Wi-Fi, to a smart device, whatever the case might be. We're going to talk right. about another level coming up where we're actually trying to solve that problem for a lot of people. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the, the show, you know, we're getting close to over 2,000 activity packs that have been delivered to folks uh, up and down San Mateo and Santa Clara County. Just amazing. Great work by our team. And they make a difference for the folks that we serve. Uh, thank you, thank, Ishrag. Uh, forgive thank me. You. Okay. Ishrag Kababa. Cheers, Ishrag. Uh, she's a board member. Thank you, Nancy Wagstaff. Yes, I met her last year. We got, yeah, Nancy Wagstaff. Thank you. Um, you know, I was telling you, like, what I love about what, and here, let's get to the $2,500 level. And what I want you folks to know, if you're not able to give tonight, you're not, um, we have, you can get to, uh, it's ability path, what, fo, dot, let me see what it is. Fort <laughs> dot com. Right? I want to get the right ability. website for them to uh, donate. <laughs> so there it's it ability is. path, ability path. forward slash bid or abilitypath.org yes. forward slash pledge, one or the other. Yes, 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 yes. I see it now, abilitypath.org forward slash bid or pledge. And if you can't bid tonight, you can pledge. You can donate tomorrow or through the weekend, whatever suits you. You know, we're not going to stop you, are we? Never. And it's right there on the screen um, up at the top for people to look at. And there uh, another toast of Ellie sparkling uh, uh, apple cider for all the wonderful people supporting tonight's Fun to Future. Cheers to all of you fine folks. Right. Cheers. Um, I, I so love the, the idea. Level, uh, so the next level, uh, you know, uh, $2,500 level helps support folks like Jenna who live independently and also she's working, learning new cooking skills. She works at Whole Foods and support with job coaches. So you know, making sure that folks will be able to continue working, living independently, and also have all the supports that they need to be able to make sure that they're being taken care of and, and their needs are being met during COVID. Very, very important. And she's going to, they're going to learn how to cook. And I like that. Then I can visit. Do you understand? The more independent they are, the better it works out for us. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's, in, people need that. They need that to be able to have that self-esteem that comes when you achieve your own things. Thank we have you, two, a couple more levels. Rachel, uh, we've Thank got a couple so more much, minutes. Rachel. That's great. We have a couple Thank more you, levels to get. <laughs> sure. This lag is a couple weird. More we it's a lag. I'm just, I'm not, yes, it's odd, but it's okay. We're raising money, man. We're at 94 grand. So lag, lag. Uh, at the, I want to go over at the thousand dollar level. You're going to help with a COVID relief. I was talking to Brian. Supplies like PPE, deep cleanings. They are so on top of this. The preschool, the integrated preschool with special needs and kids who don't have uh, specific special needs, may you know that are typical needs. Uh, they go to school together, as you know. These schools are kept so clean. They're doing everything possible to make it 1,000% safe for the kids to the best of their ability. Your $1,000 goes to that. Give a grant. Make sure they have all the right things they need to make sure the place is immaculate for these kids. Absolutely. So uh, you, you can only imagine the, the uh, incremental cost. Uh, we have about 13 locations. Many of them are still functioning. Uh, for example, the preschools and some of the therapy sites. Uh, we have to maintain all of that and make sure that they have safety sure. protocols. All the equipment is there, PPE equipment, cleaning, deep cleaning. We also changed all the filters in the building to put in uh, high quality level filters, similar to what you have in a hospital. It isn't free, wow. but it's important to maintain the health and safety of the folks we serve and also for our team. So it was certainly well worth it. Thank you, Paula Rini. Um, I love Paula. Hi, Paula. Absolutely. 
and also too, listen, we're, we're giving you other levels before we wrap this up because we want to reach this goal. At the $500 level, artists like Michael Broadhurst, who we introduced you uh, to, he can express himself through art. Uh, and there's so much that they do, art classes, social skills, touring the world via the internet, museums, gardening, computers. But also too, if you know you're saying, look, this is the virus time. I really want to give that 10 grand, but I, you know, I have to be mindful of my money. Consider the donation of the usual ticket price of $165, because right now, um, you know, this is free. So $165 or $100 to honor Ability Path Centennial. $100 if you can do that. That will go a real long way. So, yep. Thank you, Carrie. Yep. Oh, yeah. Keep it. Oh, Carrie Drake. Hi, Carrie. I miss all of you in person, you know, but this is great that we can do this. Um, so that's the way people can give. We're at 96. I see people uh, messaging, private message that they'll be pledging and getting their money out this weekend. So that's awesome to hear. Uh, and Brian, do you want to say, tell, remind people again where that the bidding remains open beyond tonight and again, where they can uh, make their bids? You bet. They can go to abilitypath.org forward slash bid. Again, on your screen, it's up at the top, abilitypath.org forward slash bid, or you can go to abilitypath.org forward slash pledge. And then I'll come back at the end of the show, Maureen, and give an update of where we are uh, in attempting to reach our goal tonight. We got some and great you know, authors waiting. We do. And, you know, I know we move through it quickly, but we want people to really see what they can do to support. And we're trying to keep you guys engaged because I think you're ready for this, right? We now have an incredible lineup of authors. Yay! I am excited to bring on our first author of the night. Woo! Gene Lewin Yang. He is a New York Times bestselling author. He writes, he draws comic books and graphic novels. He is so talented, he does two things in one. The US Library of Congress named him the fifth national ambassador for young people's literature. Of course, his role is to advocate for the importance of reading, but also for the importance of reading diverse stories about diverse people. His graphic novel, American Born Chinese, was a National Book Award finalist, as well as the winner of the Prince Award and the Eisner Award. This gentleman wins a lot of awards. His two-volume graphic novel, Boxers and Saints, won the LA Times Book Prize and was a National Book Award finalist. His other works include Secret Coders, The Shadow Hero, Superman from DC Comics, and the Avatar, The Last Airbender series from Dark Horse Comics. Gene released not one, but two books this year, Superman Smashes the Clan and Dragon Hoops. Tonight, he will be discussing Dragon Hoops. This is Dragon Hoops. Look at this. This book is over 400 pages of wonderful delightfulness. Um, it's incredible. I just started reading it and I'm loving it. So tonight he will discuss Dragon Hoops, which turns the spotlight on his own life, his own family, and the very high school where he teaches. The New York Times, you want to know what they said about it? They called it engaging, entertaining, and full of insight about race and ethnicity. Dragon Hoops follows the real-life Bishop O'Dowd Dragons, an Oakland High School basketball team, in its quest to win the California State Championship. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm, rousing welcome, a Zoom welcome, to Gene Lewin Yang. Woo, Gene, take it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me here. It really is an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this. Uh, as Maureen said, my name is Gene. I am a cartoonist. I've been writing and drawing comic books and graphic novels for about 20 years now. And just at the beginning of lockdown this year, I had a graphic novel come out called Dragon Hoops. This is a book that I wrote and drew over the course of five years. I did not mean for it to come out during pandemic, but that's kind of just what I had happen. And I'd like to spend some time telling you about the book and also telling you about what I learned from doing this book. Uh, as I'm sure you can tell from the cover, Dragon Hoops is about basketball. Now, I'm not sure if you could tell this by looking at me through your screen, but I am not a basketball guy. I am not any sort of athlete at all. In fact, when I was a kid, 
most of my basketball games that I participated in ended in some kind of pain. Like I'd either get my fingers jammed or I'd get a ball straight to the head or I'd get my feelings hurt because somebody on the court would say something mean to me. So pretty early on in my life, I learned I had to put up this wall between me and basketball just to keep from getting hurt. Now, as we all know, the walls that we put up when we're kids, they often stay with us even after we become adults. And this was definitely true for me. You know, all the way through my adulthood, I was never a fan of basketball. This lasted even after I became a teacher. So I was a high school teacher for 17 years. I taught at Bishop O'Dowd High School in Oakland, California. Up on the screen is a photo of what our campus looked like. Uh, and here is a cartoon of what our campus looked like. And here is a cartoon of what the faculty lunchroom looked like. So in that faculty lunchroom of Bishop O'Dowdy High School, all of the PE teachers sat at one table. All of the drama teachers sat at another. And all of the nerdy teachers sat at another. I, of course, sat with the nerdy teachers. Now, to be fair, there were some teachers that would move from one table to the next. But most of us, we stayed where we were most comfortable. We stayed inside of our walls. Every now and then though, something happens to get us to move outside of our walls. And for me, basketball was a big part of it. During my last year on that campus, during the 2014-2015 school year, at the very beginning, everybody on campus was talking about basketball. Everybody was talking specifically about the varsity men's team. I had no interest in basketball, but pretty soon the talk got so loud, I had to figure out what all the excitement was all about. So I sat down and I started talking to this guy right here. Uh, the guy on the screen right now, his name is Lou Ritchie. This is how he looks like in our yearbook. And here's what he looks like as a cartoon. Now Lou and I, we had been on the same campus for over a decade at that point. Uh, but because we sat at two different lunch tables, we weren't really friends. Lou is a PE teacher at Bishop O'Dowd. He is also the coach of the varsity men's basketball team. He is an athlete and I am a nerd. We're not really supposed to mix. But as I sat down and as I started asking him about why everybody was so excited, as he started answering my newbie questions about basketball, we became friends. He invited me out to watch his team play, first one game and then another, and I ended up following his team for an entire season. Over that season, I got to know Lou, I got to know his fellow coaches, I got to know his players, and I got to know the game of basketball. You know, nowadays, um, I consider myself a basketball fan, largely because of that experience during that season. I still am no expert. I'm really thankful that, you know, expert and fan are two different things. But at least I understand why people love basketball so much. I get why it's important. I get its place in American history. During that season, I got to know Lou pretty well. What I discovered was that Lou and I aren't as different as I originally thought. Just like me, he loves reading. He developed a voracious reading habit. When he was in college, he loves reading especially books about world history. And he also loves numbers. You know, he loves numbers so much that when he was a kid, he had so many sports statistics memorized in his brain that the other kids in his neighborhood would all call him the professor. So Lou isn't just an athlete. He's, he's also a nerd. He's like this hybrid. He's like a, a nerdly. And I have photographic evidence of this. Up on the screen is what Lou looked like when he was a kid not that different from what I look like. So during the season, you know, I traveled with this team. Uh, we went to Missouri and Florida and LA to plan these different tournaments. I got to sit in on their strategy sessions. I got to listen to their pep talks. And I discovered this really amazing story. It's a story about this team of adults and teenagers, of coaches and players, all chasing after this one goal all chasing after the California State Championship. You know, really, this book is about that team. It's just a nonfiction graphic novel, my very first nonfiction novel, uh, graphic novel about the Bishop O'Dowd Dragons during the 2014-2015 season. 
even though the, um, the action begins in 2014, the story really begins much earlier than that. The story actually begins with Lou. You know, during one of our very first conversations, Lou sat me down and he told me a story from his childhood that I found so compelling. I mean, that was really the moment when I was like, I have to put this in a book. So I'm gonna tell you that story right now. This is actually from chapter one in Dragon Hoops. So Lou isn't just a coach and a teacher at Bishop O'Dowd, he is also an alum. He graduated from Bishop O'Dowd in 1989. And when he was a junior in high school, he was actually on the varsity men's basketball team. He was a point guard. That team made it all the way to the California State Championship. Back then, the California State Championship was played in the Oakland Arena, which was the home to the Golden State Warriors. This was a televised game. It was the biggest game in young Lou Ritchie's life. Now, with seven seconds left, Lou's team, the Dragons, are down by one. Lou is on the floor. He somehow gets that ball in his hands. He puts it up at the buzzer. It goes through that hoop. So they win, they win by one. Lou and his team are jumping up and down. He's hugging his coach. They're freaking out. And then over the intercom comes the ref's whistle. The ref invalidates that shot, the biggest shot in young Lou Ritchie's life. And he invalidates it because supposedly the center on the Dragons team had his hand on the rim as that ball was falling through that hoop. So it was offensive goaltending. They ended up losing by one. Lou um, goes to, to college. He plays in college. He plays first for Clemson. Uh, I'm sorry. He plays first for UCLA and then for Clemson. Eventually, a hamstring injury ends his career. Uh, and he comes back to Bishop O'Dowd as first an assistant coach and then a head coach, the very first African-American head coach at that school. You know, he's, he's like 40-something when he's telling me this story in his office. Uh, and you could see the emotion in his eyes as he's talking about it. He reaches over his desk. He grabs uh, a DVD of that game from the 1980s, and he hands it to me. And he goes, Gene, you take this home and you watch it. And you tell me if that kid's hand was on the rim. So I did. I took it home and I watched it. And I have to tell you, it's, it's really hard to tell. That was a very controversial call. As an assistant coach and then a head coach at Bishop O'Dowd, he led five teams to the California State Championship. He lost all five times. So he had these five chances to redeem this old hurt, right, from his, his, uh, you know, from his teenage years, and, and he just failed every single time. One of the big reasons why I wanted to follow the Bishop O'Dowd Dragons during the 2014-2015 season was because Coach Lou had these two players on his team. One of, his, uh, one of the players was named Ivan Rabb. The other one was named Paris Austin. They were best friends, and they were also both basketball phenomenons. They were the best players that had gone through that school in maybe a generation. Ivan is now playing for the NBA in New York, and Paris just finished up a very successful career, both as a student and as a player at Cal Berkeley. Because Lou had... Ivan and Paris on this team. Um, he had a great shot at finally redeeming that old hurt. And I wanted to see if he could do it. That's what this book is about. That's what the, the Dragon Hoops is about. It's about this coach, Coach Lou, and this team that he assembled around him, all trying to redeem this old hurt from when he was 17 years old. I'm not going to tell you if he did it right now because I'm hoping you will read the book. But I have to tell you, you know, in addition to becoming a basketball fan, that, that season of following the Dragons from Missouri to L.A., it really taught me something. You know, it, it didn't just teach me about sports. It also taught me about how you have to move forward in life. I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, I met all these incredible people on that team. I, I do profiles of six of the players, including... Ivan in Paris. One of the players that I devote an entire chapter to is a young man named Jeevan. Jeevan is uh, uh, Punjabi and he is of the Sikh faith. He is also very talented at basketball and that is why, uh, that is what brought him to a Catholic school like Bishop O'Dowd. This was the very first time he ever found himself around Catholics or Christians. 
And it really took something for him to step onto the Bishop O'Dowd campus. He was really stepping out of his comfort zone to come to Bishop O'Dowd. But this was actually something that he was used to. You know, almost always, whenever he stepped on a basketball court, he was almost always the only Sikh kid and the only Punjabi kid playing. Uh, and he heard about it a lot. He heard a lot of taunting from both his opponents and from the fans. When I was following Bishop O'Dowd around from you know, Florida to Missouri to LA, I heard a lot of this sitting in the stands. Whenever Jeevan was on the court, almost always there'd be somebody in the audience who would say something really culturally inappropriate, to put it likely, at, at, this, uh, at this teenager. You know? But Jeevan did it anyways. Jeevan stepped out onto that court anyways, even though it made him uncomfortable, even though he was uncertain about what might happen. I was so inspired by Jeevan that I ended up, like I said, doing an entire chapter about his story. At an event a couple months ago, I actually read Jeevan's chapter over Zoom to an audience. And afterwards, a young woman gets on Zoom, she unmutes herself, and she tells me that she herself is Punjabi, and this was the very first time that she ever saw somebody like her portrayed in a piece of American media. She had tears in her eyes when she told me this. So just that goes to show that the, the courage that uh, Jeevan showed by stepping out on that court inspired me to tell his story in the pages of Dragon Hoops, which in turn inspired this young woman. And that is kind of what I saw over and over again as I followed uh, Jeevan and his team uh, throughout the course of the 2014-2015 season. I saw over and over again the coaches, the players, uh, all stepping out into uncertainty with courage. And, and that's really the, the, the big lesson that I learned during that year. You know, when you step out onto that court, no matter how prepared you are, no matter how talented you and your teammates are, you are not guaranteed that win. It's not like a Superman comic, right? In the Superman comic, Superman is always guaranteed to win. Whenever the Dragons play, they didn't know if they were going to win or lose. There was a, a, a level of uncertainty that they just could not erase. But even in the face of that uncertainty, they were willing to step out anyways. Especially since 2020 began, I think this, is a, a, this has just been a lesson that I've thought about over and over and over again. There's no question that what we are going through now is uncertain. We have no idea what's going to happen in the future. But sometimes that uncertainty requires us to step out anyways, to be like Coach Lou, to be like Jeevan, and step out with courage. That is a lesson that I learned from writing and drawing Dragon Hoops. And that is, I'm hoping, the lesson that comes through to the reader. Once again, thank you so much for inviting me. It really is an honor and a pleasure to get this chance to be with you today. Jean. Lewin, Yang, thank you for being with us today. Wasn't that terrific, you guys? Wasn't I just, it's very inspirational. And um, I don't know, I'm sure you have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna pose some to Jean on our behalf. But, um, you know, Jean, reading about your history and your background and you admittedly saying, you know, Maureen, um, basketball was not my thing, you know, forget oh. it. There's a million sports you could have thrown yourself into to do a, a book like this. And you specifically, purposely picked basketball. There's something bigger than the game that it tapped into you, of course. So why basketball, your most hated sport? Yeah, I, uh, you, you know, in a lot of ways, I felt like basketball chose me, right? Uh, even before I started Dragon Hoops, even before I started hearing uh, all this talk on campus about the varsity men's team, basketball was kind of invading my life. So I have a, a son who's now 16. When he was in fifth grade, he joined his school basketball team. So I started having to go to these games, even though I had no interest in, in really watching them. Uh, but as I started working on this book, I realized, you know, basketball, we think of it as like this global thing now, right? Like this multinational, multi-million dollar game, multi-billion dollar game. Yeah. But in its beginning, it wasn't like that at all. In its beginning, you know, it was kind of considered like this losery sport. It was the outsider sport. The, the communities that gravitated towards basketball at the beginning of its history 
were mostly like immigrant communities and communities of color. There were communities that just couldn't afford to maintain a field for the more traditional sports like football or baseball, right? So, so basketball was really from the beginning an outsider sport. Uh, and, and that was really fascinating to me. I think as Americans, we love cheering for the underdog. And basketball was an underdog sport. So to go from that to the global phenomenon that it is today is, was, was kind of breathtaking. What's interesting to me, and I know we have to wrap this up and move on to other authors, but I could talk to you forever. Reading your history that your father, every parent wants their kids to fall into a safe job or have a, you know, something, you know, to back them up. My father's always like, she could have been a lawyer. I don't know. She's doing this other stuff. Like she talks about her spirit and soul. Okay, whatever that is. But when you have that in you to be a writer and you, you said that you're not a natural storyteller, that you had to tap into that and you had a, um, you are a natural storyteller. So you, do you get to a place where you're like, you can't deny wanting to do what your craft is, your art, your soul? Yeah, I, I think your, your dad and my dad would have a lot to talk about. That's what it sounds <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, my dad, my dad, I mean, my dad's an immigrant, right? He works super hard. To, to make it in this country. And, and I think, I get it now, especially now that, you know, I'm in my 40s, I get it. He, he just didn't want me to screw it up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But at the same time, I think, um, I think art really does tap into that, that soul that you were talking about. And, and for, for many of us, we need that outlet, you know, just to make sense of our place in the world, we have to figure out stories. I, I, I don't think stories come easily to me. It, it feels like a lot of hard work. It's a lot of like, you know, heart-wrenching kind of work that, that it takes to, to, to put a story down on paper. But I still feel like I need to do it just to figure out the world. You know, if I don't do it, I feel a little bit lost. Well, I'm so glad you did it. And, and folks, you have to check it out. It's Dragon Hoops, a graphic novel. That doesn't mean dirty. Graphic sounds like it's, you know, it's graphic. Look at it. It's wonderful. What a talent to have both parts of your soul, your writing and your art. And uh, I'm really glad that you could be with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Thank you, Marie. Yes. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. All right, you guys, I am excited to introduce our next author this evening, chef and writer Deborah Madison, revered as America's leading authority on vegetables. The Washington Post named her the Queen of Greens, and she has been called the Vegetable Whisperer. Deborah, she is the award-winning author of 14 cookbooks, including The Vegetarian Cooking for Everyone and Vegetable Literacy, which I have to read because I still don't know the difference between a yam and a sweet potato. <laughs> she was the groundbreaking founding chef at Green's Restaurant in San Francisco. Her books have received one, two, three, four James Beard Foundation Awards and five awards from the International Association of Culinary Professionals. And in 2016, she was inducted into the James Beard Foundation Cookbook Hall of Fame. Now, Deborah has helped transform a vegetarian from a dirty word into a mainstream way of eating. Her latest book, it's a memoir, and it's called An Onion in My Pocket, My Life with Vegetables. And what you may or may not know is that before Deborah became a household name, she spent nearly 20 years as an ordained Buddhist priest coming of age in counterculture San Francisco in the 1970s. In An Onion in My Pocket, she shares for the very first time the story of those years and her experiences as a young woman trying to find her place in the world, aren't we all? I am honored to introduce the Queen of Greens, Deborah Madison. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so very, very much. And I have to say, I'm deeply honored to be part of Ability Paths Authors Luncheon. So, An Onion in My Pocket is a food memoir that encompasses just that slice of my life. And although it's a rather large slice, this book is not a cookbook. And as was just mentioned, I have written 14 cookbooks, so that's where you can go for recipes. But I got really tired of writing cookbooks and recipes. And so I need in my pocket, my life with vegetables is a memoir. And it includes a lot. It actually, um, such as how we looked at food from the 60s on, especially vegetarian food, my 20 years of Buddhist practice in San Francisco, how I came up with menus at Greens. And in fact, there's a lot about Greens in here, in this book. 
um, which I just found out because you're always told to reread your book before it comes out because a lot may have happened you may have forgotten about but there is a lot about greens in here and I also write about books and inspiration and book tours those hard and sometimes funny things that a lot of us were lucky to do I write about my vegetarian problem and finally what matters when it comes to food and I found out that what matters are qualities like kindness and generosity and not whether there's meat present or absent on the plate. Food can go in any direction as long as it has heart. An onion in my pocket also includes words about growing up in California with two very different parents. One, my father, for whom the glass was almost always full, and the other, my mother, for whom the glass was always empty. So much so that I wonder how it was that I actually became a chef and a cook. I write about our monthly trips to San Francisco, which were so wonderful, that included visits to the now defunct, but once quite marvelous Crystal Palace Market, the Golden Gate Park, the city of Paris for pastries, and Sausalito for butterscotch ice cream cones, which we kids ate on a barge with seagulls screaming over us. It was so much fun. And I write about the only time I ever really encountered a steak, which came with a questionnaire from the animal science department at UC Davis, where my dad was a botany professor. And I remember that that steak was tough and gray, you had to chew it a lot, and I couldn't imagine what the big deal was because at that time, what I really wanted was a horse, of course. So once a year, my mother went home to Connecticut, and during that week, our diet changed radically. My dad came back from the airport with bags of groceries galore, and suddenly, Forget the shredded wheat that we always, always had. We had fried eggs for breakfast, basted in bacon grease of all things. We had chicken and dumplings, or maybe short ribs for dinner, pies and cobblers for dessert. It was always extremely hot in August, and we feasted on the Midwestern winter foods of my father. Something still goes off in my brain when I see short ribs on a menu. But I don't think this bizarre week was really the reason, because my brain also lights up at the mention of salt cod and fish tacos, which we'd never even heard of and didn't really have. Usually we ate lamb burgers, because lamb was cheaper than beef, except when my brother came home from his stays at Andover and at Harvard, and then we had a roast to welcome the prodigal son home. I'm sure he was quite tired of eating big chunks of meat by that time. My mother was a very complex person. I miss her terribly. She was an artist, a writer, and a musician who was not interested in food ever, although she did like the idea of food. The great irony of her taking money from the food budget to make sure that all of her four kids had lessons in art, music, or ballet, is that we all became involved with food. In addition to food, I was also a Zen student for nearly 20 years, which I also write about because it was important for forming some of my first experiences of cooking for others. I was the head cook at the city center when I first lived there a guest cook at Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, and a student who ate and was interested in food. And I was also, of course, the founding chef of Greens. I had a lot of other positions at Zen Center too, which had nothing to do with food at all. But the ones that were involved with cooking and eating and also shopping for food at the produce terminal and the Alamany Farmer's Market, these are the experiences that I tended to write about. At our monastery, Tassajara, our meals were taken in formal meditation posture in the meditation hall. And I described them in detail. And 
in doing so, I discovered why I probably eat too fast. Still, the food was vegetarian and simple for the most part. It was even austere, but on our days off, we ate in the dining room from plates with silverware instead of the meditation hall. And this one meal was always big and rich and it included something we never ever had otherwise, which was dessert. It was wonderful. Everybody ate way too much and was in pain for the evening meditation period. Tassajara was a very interesting place to be, what with austere food, big food, town trips which enabled students to order foods of their own choosing, gardens to rely on, for vegetables to cook with, and the compost to feed them. But I always had to question vegetarian food. Why couldn't it be beautiful and bright and colorful and good? And then I'd remember that we didn't have a lot of choice the way we do now when it comes to produce, which is the beautiful, bright, colorful, and to me, the good part of a meal. We in the counterculture were young and we were earnest and we were not very adept at cooking. Our food was really pretty stodgy and it wasn't bright and beautiful and good. It just wasn't. So no wonder vegetarian food had a bad reputation. And that's something I tried to change at Greens. And I think I succeeded at least to some degree. And I think the world has gone on in a very interesting way since then. Once on a book tour, I was in an airport in the Midwest and a man rushed up to me and said, I saw you on television this morning and your food looked so good. It looked great. But then he commented in a much slower, lower voice that he was not, unfortunately, a vegetarian. This comment and comments like him drove me crazy, 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 crazy. Did you have to be a vegetarian to enjoy an eggplant gratin with a dome of saffron custard? I was never comfortable with the vegetarian label. To me, it was about pushing food away and manners somehow mattered. I never wanted anyone to jump through hoops for me. I wasn't even necessarily a vegetarian. I have learned a lot about flavors and textures of ordinary food by, by what? By eating meat. That's how you learn. In fact, I originally wanted to call this book My Vegetarian Problem, but in the end, one chapter, which was in many ways the hardest to write, was what the vegetarian problem became. But it did point me to the issue that lies at the heart of the book, which is that, and at this came only after much thought from me, um, is that there are things that do matter more than whether there is meat on the plate or not. What kinds of things? I already gave you a hint. Generosity, patience, true hospitality, care, kindness, things like that. They matter. And while I do not want to take part in any way in industrial meat or produce for that matter, I do prefer a plant-based diet. I also think it's important to be open to all kinds of people and situations. So when I first moved here, I was on the board of our farmer's market for 11 years, but I've also been on the board of the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Association, twice even. And I have to say at the same time, Jim Hightower, who used to be the former, he was the former agricultural commissioner of Texas, chides me about how being in the middle of the road is where you get hurt. And that's true. I've had to dust myself off a number of times. Years ago, I spent a month at Hedgebrook, a writer's colony in Washington state. And at that time, I had a lot of questions about my self-worth. And I felt that I should have gotten a PhD in something, in anything, just to be more useful in the world. But instead, I began writing a memoir while I was at Hedgebrook, which I hated when I reread it a year later, 
Why? Because it was so whiny and so full of regret. And surely my life had more than whines and regrets. So I kept with it over the years, writing and rewriting it and asking myself a lot of difficult questions. And I think you'll be happy to know that the final book is not at all the book it started out to be. Before closing, I'd like to read a little piece from this book. And it's from the very last chapter, which is called Nourishment. And th these are just a collection of meals I remember because they were important to me for those qualities I mentioned. And this is called a Dinner in a Motel 6. In the first few years of the new century, Alice Waters sent me off from a Berkeley visit with a lunch to eat on my drive back to New Mexico. I finally ate it at the end of the day in Needles, California, in a Motel 6 on a little wooden table set in front of the air conditioner. It was about 106 degrees outside and nearly sunset. The sound leaves were flat and limp by this time, but the bandol rosé was still cool from the ice it was packed in. I don't remember the rest of the food Alice had packed, actually. Maybe it was chicken or something, but I loved that meal. I felt so well taken care of by her, and it made me happy and content. My little table held just what was needed. The meal, the wine, a linen napkin, a nestled bamboo knife, fork, and spoon. And now I always stay at that motel and come prepared to set my dinner on that little wooden table. Of course, I do realize that this is a very difficult time for everyone with COVID and the fires. In many ways, this book points back to a more innocent time, a time before masks and before the horrible mass destruction of the West. Still, I hope that you enjoy the food you make and share with your families and that we will be at the same table together soon. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Deborah. Thank I, I would love to be at the same table with you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. So I wanted to say to you, I, I had a, a follow-up question too, if I may. Yeah. What's interesting to me is you talk about, don't label me. Like, yes, I eat vegetables. I like vegetables. But we, we put a label on somebody and then we, are, they, okay. we assume they're something or that, that represents something. But when I was reading more about you, you have a philosophy, whether it be meat or vegetables, when it comes to eating. What is your basic philosophy around food? Around food? Yeah, about you know, eating what you eat. Still so much what you eat, but I do care about its provenance a lot. I don't want to eat industrial meat or vegetables. I want to eat things to, for me that are wholesome, that are good. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I do try to do that. And I do it. I shop at the farmer's market. I grow my own vegetables. I don't eat a lot of meat, but I do eat some grass fed beef and so forth and so on. And also my husband is 81. He's a cancer survivor of not very many years, and he feels a need for meat, and he grew up with meat. So it's a part of our life, but it's not a big part for me. Very interesting, because growing up the daughter of a, a, my mom's from Ireland in a farm, every, if you didn't have meat on the plate, you were almost being punished. Yeah. And yeah. you've changed that way of thinking, and, and I appreciate that. And I'm so glad I got to meet you today, even if it's on the Zoom stage. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I actually have eaten in Ireland. I mean, I lived in Ireland and I love Ireland and it's, it is the meatiest culture, but one of the best, and it's good. I mean, it's all good, but one of the best meals I had there was actually a vegetarian meal and county pork. And who knew? I write about that actually in the book. Oh, I have to read about that. I always say Irish cooking, it's boil, boil, ham, or boil, boil. Everything is boiled to the end degree, but it's changed over the years quite a lot. Yeah. Oh, how exciting. I can't wait to read that. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah Madison, an onion in my pocket, my life with vegetables. Thank you. We are having a fantastic time. And now we are going to bring on our final author of the evening. His name is Daniel Mason. He is a physician and an award-winning author who has been called one of our best historical novelists. 
His uh, novels include The Piano Tuner, A Far Country, and The Winter Soldier. His work has been translated into, get this, 28 languages. He's been awarded the Joyce Carol Oates Prize and the Northern California Book Award for Fiction and shortlisted for the James Tate Black Memorial Prize. Now, The Piano Tuner was produced, I, I can't believe this, as an opera by Music Theater Wales. I mean, I think that's amazing. And adapted to the stage by Lifeline Theater. His short stories and essays, they have appeared in The Atlantic and Harper's, among others. Now, Daniel is a clinical assistant professor in the Stanford University Department of Psychiatry. His research and his uh, teaching interests, he's into subjective experience of mental illness, the subjective experiences of mental illness, as well as the influence of literature, history, and culture on the practice of medicine. I have to ask him about that. His first short story collection is called A Registry of My Passage Upon the Earth, in which Daniel tells nine remarkable, and trust me, they are remarkable tales of endurance, ecstasy, and epiphany. As one reviewer put it, and I totally concur, he shows how quickly and completely he can immerse readers like you uh, in a foreign place in time. I haven't read a book that has done that for me in so long. I mean, bam, you are there. Uh, please welcome the author of A Registry of My Passage Upon the Earth, Daniel Mason. Welcome, Daniel. Hi. It's a great joy to be speaking today at the Ability Path Authors Luncheon. Uh, of course, I wish that this could be in person, uh, but the fact that the organization is pushing on is testament to their flexibility even during periods of adversity. In a moment, I'll talk a bit about my book and its relation to Ability Path, but I wanted to begin by saying that my relationship with this organization actually goes back a long time. Uh, mostly through my friendship with David Hahn, who many of you remember. Um, I've known David, uh, Susan, Michael, and Lori since I was an infant, uh, since before I can remember. And David was always one of the great friends of my life. His humor, warmth, enthusiasm, and kindness always made the world a war more welcome place. And he taught me what a gift it was to have a friend with a different neurological experience of the world. As I mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist now, and um, most all of my patients uh, come from diverse uh, neurological and psychological experiences. And David example, David's example uh, always stands out for um, how difference is a strength. Indeed, I could say that uh, today's world is truly sorely uh, in need of his presence. Because of this, I've long wanted to uh, come to this luncheon, and I was sorry that last year, after the Winter Soldier came out, I was unable to come. Perhaps it's fitting, though, that I'm here today because registering my passages upon the earth um, is directly inspired by people who experience the world in a, in a different way. Each of the short stories tells about a moment in the life of somebody in crisis and epiphany, many of whom have uncommon psychological or mental experiences. There's a doctor with unusual seizures, an inspired pharaoh, a biologist in a moment of epiphany. But one of the characters really stands out, and indeed it's from this story, the last one, in the collection, the title story, that I'd like to devote this talk. A few words of, of background. Um, back in 2003, I was traveling in the northeastern part of Brazil, doing research for my second book called A Far Country. I passed through this little town called Japaratuba in the state of Sergipe. And this is a photograph taken from 1920s, maybe 1930s of Sergipe. It actually didn't look too different from, um, from when, I was, when I was there back, back in 2003. And um, when I was waiting there, I can't re remember, I think, waiting for a bus there, um, I found myself in this little um, cultural center um, that was really almost empty except for this large photograph of this man dressed in this spectacular clothing and here's the image that I saw and he reminded me in many ways of one of my favorite patients back at San Francisco General Hospital a man who used to adorn himself with uh, little bits of traffic signals like cones and reflectors and so forth that he found around the city so I wondered who he was, and when I asked, they mentioned that he was the most, the most famous person from Japaratuba, 
that um, that he had gone to Rio de Janeiro um, and become a very famous artist there. Um, and, and I was intrigued from the start, but really nothing prepared me for, for the story that I'd encounter when I began to learn more. Arthur Bispo de Rosario was born in 1911 uh, in this very arid region of the country. He came to Rio de Janeiro in the Navy, perhaps on a ship like this one. And um, we don't know too much about his experience in the Navy, except for that he was uh, discharged um, irregularly. So something must have happened while he was there. We also know that he was a very good boxer. And for a long time, people didn't know about his, his um, background as a boxer, they, they had just sort of heard that he had mentioned it several times, um, but it wasn't until later on that all these articles were uncovered um, showing him as a boxer. Then in 1938, December 22nd to be specific, at midnight, angels appeared to him uh, and led him to depart on a two-day march through the city guided by visions and pulled along by voices. He visited various famous sites in Rio de Janeiro, uh, ending up at last at the monastery of San Bento, where he stood before a group of monks and proclaimed that he'd come to judge the living and the dead. From there, he was taken to a hospital in Rio de Janeiro and then transferred to a more long-term psychiatric hospital in the interior of the state where he would spend much of the remaining 50 years of his life. And this is a card that shows his uh, registration in, in the hospital along with his diagnosis um, of paranoid schizoph schizophrenia. And at the hospital, Arthur Bispo probably would have been forgotten like the thousands of others who were there had it not been for the particular nature of his belief and his abilities. For he believed that God had chosen him to create a registry of the world, a series of presentations through art of what the world of men was like, and this was going to be shared with God on Judgment Day. This might be the kinds of ships that were present on the earth, and so this is a photograph taken of him um, kind of in the middle of the period of time while he was there working on his on his ship. This was taken by a visiting photographer who was there to take photographs of other things and happened upon Bispo. And these photographs were actually just discovered pretty recently. This is an image actually showing one of the ships that he created. We remember that he was a sailor, so a number of... Um, this was a great interest of his. Here's another image which shows um, sort of multiple ships um, all bearing different kinds of insignia that a sailor in the uh, Brazilian Navy would have would have encountered. Um, and his registry varied from the grand um, productions like these like these boats to some very mundane visions of what life was like for people on earth. So the kinds of sandals that people wore, as we can see here, a collection of types of confetti, um, of tin cups uh, used by inmates at the asylum in Rio de Janeiro. And not everything that was uh, this kind of collage, um, other periods of time, he would create these incredible embroideries using his bed sheets and by de-threading his clothing. And so most of these embroideries, and these are great big bed sheet size embroideries, um, are done in blue. Which were which is the color of the of the clothing that people wore at at um, at the hospital that he at, that he was at, and so these are filled with all kinds of incredible detail, life in the navy, types of games that people play. Um, you can see on this one windmills, different kinds of buildings, um, embassies of different con countries, others like uh, this image here, and you can actually see the stamp in the upper right hand corner. This is the stamp of the asylum on the, on the bed sheets. It's, um, showing um, more abstract images, different types of shapes, and so forth. Probably his most important work was the uh, embroider that he created to wear on Judgment Day, his so-called cloak of presentation. And uh, you might remember this from the first image that I showed of Arthur Bispo. 
Here's an image front and back. And on this were important images from his life on Earth, um, other symbols that are now only beginning to be understood. And then on inside were the names of people who would ascend to heaven with him on Judgment Day. So um, this included other inmates, people he'd met throughout his life outside the asylum, uh, and then also those nurses and, and doctors and assistants at the asylum who were good to him and, and he felt would um, ascend to heaven as well. Now, all of this um, occurred really in, in obscurity, this work. People at the asylum knew about this and, in, and uh, a number over time increasingly would help him out, bring him materials, um, go to watch him work. He developed a very close relationship with a intern who worked there sort of forms the basis of, um, of the short story that I wrote. Then when the Brazilian dictatorship fell and reporters came to the asylum to report on um, what it was like to, to be in the asylum under the dictatorship to report on abuses there, they encountered this man in his room at that time who had created um, upwards of a thousand pieces of art and he became the sort of center of, of attention of this expose. And one thing led to another. He became discovered by the art world. And um, soon, a few years later, he had a, uh, sh his first uh, show. Now, he didn't consider his work art. He considered his work to be um, exhibits of what life was like um, to be shared with God, but but he let his work go and be shown. Um, the The show was called Registries of My Passage Upon the Earth, which is where I got the title for my story um, and for and for my book. And um, and return to this one final image of Bispo. This is again when he was younger, um, wearing this cloak of presentation in in an earlier um, in in an early in an earlier stage. So I've been studying him, thinking about him for nearly 20 years now. And as I think about his world and the voices that inspired him, I found a new uh, appreciation for the artistic process generally, because in a way I feel that he was able to articulate something that I haven't found articulated elsewhere. This drive to create, to capture, to share experience, um, to let the the rest of the world know what private experience might be like. And this brilliance and his artistic brilliance doesn't in any way negate the suffering that he endured. In fact, in an interview, he says that if given a choice, he would have chosen not to create. He would have preferred for the voices to have left him alone. But the legacy that he created endures and it remains an inspiration for me and I think vivid evidence of what different experiences of the world can offer us. So thank you so much for your support for Ability Path, and I hope everybody is um, is carrying on well throughout uh, the pandemic and these difficult times. Thank you, thank you so much, Daniel Mason. Again, a registry of my passage upon the earth. Yeah, you have to get this because I'm in the middle of it. And you know, Daniel, what I wanted to say to you about your book. Um, it's interesting because you're a science man, a master of medicine, a master of words, and you bring the two worlds together, which isn't typical for people usually one side or the other, and you uh, meld both. When I was re started reading your, the first story, it, it reminded me the way you use assonance and alliteration and flow. It reminded me very much of an Irish writer. Uh, and then again, I'm thinking, well, you are writing about a boxer named Burke, so that's not that unusual. Well, it is. But, is Burke a real person or is he based on a time, like you put him in that time period? Yeah, so, um, so Jacob Burke's not a real person. He's a, a medley, I think, of a number of boxers from that time period. The fight, the, the, the matches that he takes part in, those are very much real. And a number of the other boxers that he fights were, were real people. But the particular ca character of muscular Jacob Burke was was a, uh, a collage, um, to use a word from Arthur Bispo, that, that, I, that I created. Well, it, it's, he's so vivid, so vivid. Um, uh, people will, will see when they read it themselves, but this is what interests me so much in reading about you, is um, 
When you say the influence of literature, history, and culture on the practice of medicine, the influence of literature, history, culture on the practice of medicine. I'm sure this, you could do a dissertation on this, perhaps you did, but what does that mean and how does it affect medicine? Sure. This is very, a wonderful question, a very, a, very, a very big question. I guess as time's gone on and um, I've spent more and more years practicing psychiatrists, I think what, what stands out to me is how much of our practice is, is shaped by factors outside of the science. And of course, the science is extraordinary, um, the scientific advances that we're noticing even sort of week by week today during the course of the pandemic are truly amazing. But at the same time, when you look at a lot of, of medical history, in particular psychiatric history, we're very much driven um, and informed by the culture that surrounds us, um, whether or not these are say, uh, religious beliefs or artistic beliefs. One of the stories, for instance, is a story about a physician in the 19th century, the story is called the, the Second Doctor Service. And this is a story of a, of a, of a man who has this sort of unusual kind of seizure um, during which he's replaced by a slightly better version of himself. So he loses consciousness, but he continues to act in, in the world and kind of carry forth in the world. And the story that I wrote is inspired both by medical re reports, because there, there happened to be sort of medical interest um, around the, in, in the late 19th century in a particular kind of seizure in which a person didn't say, you know, fall on the ground and, and convulse, but um, remain kind of present. And it was something that's called dreamy state seizure. Um, partial seizures, the different, different words that were, were used. Um, but there's this fascination of, sort of what, what happens to a person during these kinds of moments. Relatively rare, but of great interest for doctors. But of course, then there's also a literary interest in this as well, if we think of the story of Dr. Jekyll and, and Mr. Hyde. And um, the fascinating part is that these two histories uh, inspired each other. So the, the doctors are reading the literature and forming their conception of the world by the literature that they're that they're reading. Hmm. That's it's it's intense. It's interesting. It's fascinating. And your book is fascinating. A registry of my passage upon the earth. I'm so glad I got to meet you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Okay, so before I turn it back over to Brian to close the evening, I have to thank all of our authors for such captivating, insightful talks. Jean Luen Yang. Deborah Madison and Daniel Mason. We are so glad you could be here and we're so grateful for your support of Ability Paths Mission. And a few reminders for those of you watching, don't forget you can purchase all of the author's books and any other books at abilitypath.org forward slash bookstore through October 25th. Enter the code abilitypath2020 at checkout and a portion of your purchase will benefit Ability Path. You can still donate to the Fund of Future or bid on artwork. The art auction will close on Sunday, October 25th at 9 p.m. And if you aren't on the mailing list and you want to make sure you receive a free copy of the art calendar, you do want that. You can sign up at abilitypath.org forward slash art calendar. You guys are the best. You are the best. Keep supporting this wonderful organization. And now let me turn it over to Brian. Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, you brought so much energy to tonight. Thank you for hosting our 29th annual Authors Luncheon special evening edition. It was really fantastic. We appreciate all that you do to support our mission. And uh, so far tonight, drum roll please, my toast, we have already raised over 115,000. So we have just a little bit more to go to hit our target of 125. And again, you can go to our website, Maureen provided information. You can see up here on the screen, abilitypath.org forward slash bid to help us close out and hit our target for the 29th annual Authors Luncheon. As we wrap up, I just wanna thank again, uh, Jean Luen Yang, Deborah Madison and Daniel Mason for spending your time with us this evening, for sharing your stories in your wonderful books. I have, uh, Two of them with me, and Deborah, your book is on order. So, an onion in my pocket, my life with vegetables. Uh, so, make sure you pick up a copy. These are wonderful, wonderful authors and incredible books that they've written. 
uh, all three of them. Thank you for being with us this evening. I also want to thank Shane Oliver for serving as uh, in our community as an essential worker. So it was a great opportunity we had to hear Shane's story and him sharing that with us. I want to thank the Graybird Foundation for putting Shane's story together. Uh, Graybird, as you may know, helped us with our entire rebranding effort, uh, rolling out Ability Path and helping do that research over multiple years. They've got four more individual stories that we're going to be sharing in the coming months, talking about the impact of employment and what inclusion looks like in the workplace. So I know you're not going to want to miss those four upcoming videos. And again, Shane, thank you for working so hard to support our entire community. Elaine Cohen is an incredible board chair. Elaine, thank you for your leadership and for being part of the program this evening. I hope everyone also caught the pre-show with uh, four remarkable ladies, Jerry King, thank you. Paula Rini, thank you for being there. Jane Wagg, staff Hinton, also a board member. We appreciate you hosting that. And Carol Windsor, who's president of the Auxiliary and also an Ability Path board member. Thank you, uh, all four of you, for kicking us off and getting this evening's show going and uh, setting the right tone and the right mood for what this is all about. I want to thank the uh, entire event planning committee for all the time and effort and energy you put in in making tonight happen, helping put together this amazing online event, adapting to the vagaries of COVID-19, and still delivering an incredible evening with some remarkable authors. Uh, so thank you, uh, the planning committee, for making that happen. And in particular, a special thanks to Carol Dupe Muller for securing three incredible authors. Thank you again for joining us. And a huge thank you to all of you for tuning in. You know, I know there's another event taking place tonight. So thanking for, thank you for making time to be with us. Thank you for your generosity in helping us serve those in our community. You are incredibly generous and we are grateful for all that you do to support our mission of inclusion. No program closing would be, uh, would be uh, right without making sure I acknowledge some folks who helped make this happen. Kim Mahotra, Kristen Ramirez, Karen French, Sohela Moizan, Krishna Daniels, Kerry Hagan, and Samantha Baker. That's our marketing and development team. Thank you for all of the work that you've put into this over the many months in helping uh, us deliver what I thought was a very enjoyable, informative, and inspiring evening. So again, everyone, thank you for joining us. Be well, stay safe. We'll get through this together. Thank you. And we'll see you next year for the 30th Authors Luncheon. Good night.